So hello, and um, we're we're all three here gathered today to have a conversation about team coaching, team coaching supervision, and Angelos, your new book, Team Coaching, yes. Mastering the Art of Synergy. I think one of the things we all three have in common is a real um, enthusiasm for and fascination with this very fast growing part of the coaching industry. Um, and maybe we all see slightly different perspectives on that. Um, but we thought it would be useful to have a, a, a three-way roundtable conversation about some of the things we are noticing in the profession. And, um, and Angelos, your book, it strikes me, is a, is a little bit different from some of the other books that are out there. And I think it could be useful for, for anyone who's interested in this topic to understand something about what made you write this and what yeah. What is it that makes it different? First, it's the love about team coaching, practicing team coaching uh, the, all these years, and at the same time, uh, training people on team coaching as well as coaching, but also as team coaching as a new discipline. New in the sense that uh, it has been around for many, many years, and there are so many professionals that have been researching and practicing that and developing team coaching as a discipline. Uh, on the other hand, I think lately it has become more of, we could say, it has become professionalized in the sense that uh, major bodies like EMCC and ICF have created standards. So now it's making it more clear uh, where team coaching stands in the world of professional development, of organizational development, of coaching, what's the relation with different modalities. And uh, I think because, at least at the moment, there is not enough literature uh, out there published or uh, the books that are available on team coaching are very interesting, but they are not always covering the whole spectrum of team coaching. And what I mean by that, um, not everyone can get an introduction and support and have all the theoretical underpinnings uh, and also the practical practical ways to apply it in coaching have um, tools and models and plans on how to proceed in an organization and from the time they are designing to the time they are implementing and how they are evaluating and what are the different ways they can work with uh, their associate coaches or the co-coach or everyone involved uh, from the HR sponsor to the uh, team leader and so on. And what do they need in terms of taking care after their own practice, their own self, having team coaching supervision and then seeing where does that go to, which no, but no one knows but we can get a guess or we can see what are the challenges right now. So in that sense, you could say that my motivation of writing this was to, first of all, share what I have uh, learned by practicing team coaching and what I have learned by training people on team coaching, understanding what do they need, not uh, for the purpose of having a very wide theoretical understanding, but at the same time having uh, what is important, what is crucial, uh, and all, at the same time having the practical tools to apply that. Yeah. Shall I bring, build on that then, Angelos, because yeah. I would echo what you said about this being a relatively new practice, but as you know, I, I come to this with a passion for supervision and reflection on practice, and what I have seen over the last probably five or six years is coaches have come from a one-to-one -one practice 
of excellent executive coaching and suddenly either they are discovering that team coaching is now the norm or the expectation, but at the same time, organizations are asking for something that they're calling team coaching, but they're not always clear what they're asking for. So coach has team coach training, says, oh, good, let's go and do some team coaching when the client says so. But the client doesn't always know what their team may need. And I meet coaches who have made this transition from one-to-one -one into team coaching and have been thrown off balance, confused, surprised, delighted that, gosh, when they get in a room with a group of executives and they are coaching the group or the team, that this is much more complex and much more challenging and demanding than their familiar one-to-one -one practice. And the need for coaches to understand that transition for themselves and to educate the client organization what the client may hope or expect from a team coaching intervention. I think this book is ably equipped to be able to offer that guidance to the organization as much as to the practitioner. That's great. I just want to throw in there that even with extensive training in team coaching, I can be the person who winds up in a room full of, uh, with a team going, I don't know what's going on. I'm not quite sure what's happening right now. The complexity of it, yeah. even for people who are, you know, expert. I think it's very difficult to be expert in this just because there's so much going on all the time. And, you know, the width of your book, Angelo, sort of speaks to that, to how much there is for those of us in this profession to consider when we're doing this work. I find it as coaching and team coaching is becoming more of a standard uh, in today's organizations with all the internal coaches and now internal team coaches as well. Uh, in some organizations, this is becoming even more complicated, even more complicated in to understand what kind of team coaching intervention should be uh, designed and, and implemented and how do we evaluate that and uh, maybe sometimes there's confusion like many sometimes uh, in the past I have understood that people uh, were confusing team building for team coaching for example and I think sometimes even today yeah, there, you might find people that are confusing groups for teams. Yes. Yeah. And that builds, if I could build on that, there's something here around um, the, the cultural norms, both within an organization, but also with technology and globalization. Teams are not confined geographically to one, one culture, one, one social or, or country culture. Teams are global and the complexity and diversity across a global organization and the expectations and the assumptions that, well, we are a team, but maybe in one country or another, team is not the philosophy, it's not the norm. So a team comes together with certain presuppositions that, oh yeah, we all have a common purpose, but different countries, different age groups, different marketplaces have a different and diverse expectation of what does team actually mean. So the whole question around um, is it a team coaching intervention that is being asked for or is it something different? Often I find in supervision, the coach is not quite clear what the client has actually asked for. They've heard the word team mentioned, so they make assumptions and jump to an approach that may be premature or may be untimely, given the stage of where a group of executives 
across the globe in different countries may be coming together to perhaps just establish a common purpose within their group. And that too is, is a staging post in how this practice may or may not be offered and provided. Yeah, great. And I love what this leads to what you were saying earlier too, Alison, that a book like this could be useful for people who are buyers of team coaching because often the client isn't quite sure what they need either. So there's a dance that needs to happen, a, a relational contracting con conversation that, that may be beyond one conversation with the client and the coach about what actually is being sought after here. What are we doing together? And keeping that, that conversation alive. Um, and as you say, Angelos, it might be team, team building may be part of the intervention, um, mm -hmm. but then there might also be some coaching or there, there may be some facilitation, some learning that needs to be uh, delivered. And again, I mean, everything is in here. I know it says on the back here, this book is not an exhaustive encyclopedia on team coaching. But as I was reading it, I thought to myself, wow, it really does have, a, it's a, I would call it a compendium. And it really does have things like what do the ICF and the EMCC say are the main uh, modalities in this type of intervention? And what are the kinds of things that a team coach or an aspiring team coach needs to pay attention to? So I think you really have gone into some of these questions that Allison and I and you are raising here is like there's a lot of complexity and there's a, there's a lot of information you're setting out for people to help them with that. Yes, it's interesting. Uh, adding up uh, to some of the themes that you have already shared, Alison and Dorothy, I think there are so many other things that are happening, you know, like generational differences, so different ways to motivate things, tricks that we used to do uh, are not working anymore. So you, you want to take this into account as well when you're working with a team. Mm. Do you uh, have something in mind when you say that, Angela? When you think about something that, because you've been doing this for a while now, is there something in mind that maybe you used to be a norm, but you see it changing already? Yes, of course. Um, I am between the baby boomers and the Generation X. Um, now that um, the millennials and the generations that are becoming bigger and bigger at the workplace, uh, the, a number of things are changing. For example, for people like me, I was a ba I am a baby boomer, but I always felt like a Generation X, and now I feel like this whole new generation that is taking over over the workplace is somehow giving me permission to speak behave request different things or take different things or not not allowing things being taken for granted on my behalf as i was feeling when i was entering the workplace a number of years ago and when we're talking about the workplace we usually talk about teams in general uh, so that so that seems like there's a lot of work here that changes the way that you uh, make design interventions or you expect the the team to respond, react, be empowered, motivated, and so on, which says which are um, one of the central things we are trying to achieve. Um, depending on your own or approach, of course, but I think the at the end of any kind of coaching intervention, individual or team, you want to create the momentum, you want everybody to be inspired and motivated, you want to get the engines running, right? I think, Angelos, you've touched on a really important piece here because the work that you've done around generational differences is really powerful. And I was really struck recently in one of your workshops where you highlighted the fact that there are now four generations in the workplace. Well, I've, I'm a baby boomer too. So three generations beyond me, that's my great nieces and nephews. Wow. Well, 
even the rent members of my family and I'm not quite sure always how to communicate with them and what are their expectations. So if I'm intervening in an organization where we have all these layers of motives, of intentions, of values, of work expectations, how do we engage four generations in a team to produce the the common purpose that the team coaching may aspire to to provide this is this is fascinating and challenging and exciting stuff isn't it and the group dynamics and interactions just with a group of strangers across countries let alone vertically in generational terms is fascinating and we cannot make assumptions and the demands on the coach to be conscious of, mindful of, wondering why it may or may not be working is extremely exciting, but also very challenging. Yeah. Yes, you're right. There are so many things that are changing. And I share your enthusiasm that I felt. Uh, I think we love what we do, at least personally speaking for myself, because it's so it's alive, it's changing, and it doesn't let you uh, become complacent because you uh, you always need to look after what is happening and how you can be in service of whatever is needed there for, for the team, for the organization, or the individual. So that's in the same way that it applies for individual coaching, also for team coaching, only with the only difference that it's much more complex, it's much more different, it's, it's much more uh, diverse and in so many different layers. So it's, as you mentioned, and the different cultures, it's different, um, it's different generations, and uh, there. I mean, to take just into account the last ten years, so many things have changed in our culture and the workplace. Like we talk about vulnerability, we talk about the growth mindset, we talked about uh, new concepts that. 15 or 20 years ago uh, were being seen like something that you really want to take care of that because there's something wrong. Dorothy is, looks very vulnerable, for example. Sorry to <laughs> use your name, but you understand what I'm saying. Uh, I And all these things are changing. And at the same time, they are not changing because all the generations are present at the workplace. So you want to take this into account. Yeah, I, what's coming up for me as you're both talking about this is with all these sort of interlayered complexities, age and location and culture and so on, one of the key things we're doing as team coaches is helping teams communicate in a way that works for everybody, communicate in their in their relationships. And even that is changing um and i was thinking i think you you I, I was looking at the chapter that has to do with technology uh and you know when i started team coaching i only team coached in the room and as i started to have to do virtual before the pandemic i was sort of struggling about how to make the 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 ways of working with a team in the room happen virtually because we are very different in relationship we communicate very differently in relationship when we move to whiteboard technology or zoom or teams or something so even this is fast changing as well and different different uh, generations are handling that differently and we can no longer assume that uh, because a baby boomer might prefer to communicate on email that you know somebody who's much younger in their team may never want to communicate on email so there's there's all that going on as well um so you're you're there's just um, I wouldn't want to put people off team coaching, but there is we're, what we're saying is there's a lot to it. Supervision is now mandated, isn't it, by the ICF and the EMCC as part of the standards that you referenced earlier, Angelos. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it feels like what is it that's important to say about supervision? Because we're all also supervisors of team coaches. What would we want to get across about supervision? Well, perhaps I could offer um, 
David Clutterbuck and I did some research in 2017 looking at team coaching super and supervision and what do team coaches want now in terms of their own ongoing resourcing and their development and their learning and the collective findings of that inquiry was that team coaches wouldn't practice team coaching without supervision and whilst there are different interpretations of the word supervision for me and what i discovered with practitioners is it's a place particularly for team coaches often to come together in a group of other practitioners to share and exchange and get different perspectives and to replenish themselves, to recharge their batteries, to get reassurance that they're not knowing what to do. The uncertainty, the apparent stuckness or slow progress is not their fault. Often they take it as their own responsibility, but to enable a team to make progress, the coach isn't the only one in the driving seat. And that may feel very challenging for many who come out of one-to-one where they can engage their client and get progress action orientation. Um, And I think the other thing will probably come onto it is the notion of out of the research also and more recently is this whole notion of co-coaching. So a team coach goes in as a dyad rather than on their own and with a team of perhaps more than six or eight the general norm has become you go in as a pair and modeling a team of two team coaches to facilitate the coaching is becoming equally very supportive but that has its own complexity too which comes to supervision more and more i'm working with two coaches as a dyad working in their organizational systems. So that's a, an offering on that perspective of, of supervision. So I don't know if either of you want to add to that or build on that. Just before going to you, Angelo, so I would, what I was getting in touch with is it can be lonely. If yeah. you know, you're working with many as a team coach, you're working with a whole system and it can be lonely without the support of a co-coach or a supervisor or peers. You know, that's part of the role of, of going in as a system. I think of my supervisor as part of my system when I go in um, or a group that I'm in or peer peer things. So um, and I love that you're mentioning co-coaching or dyad coaching which is recommended by the bodies as well um, because it does deal with that but it also what is happening in the system with the team is very likely to come into the system of the co-coaching dyad and if there's conflict in the team that can come into the co-coaching dyad but also if this dyad is working really well that can go into the team and model that for the team so There's a synergy to the subject of mastering the art of synergy. There's a synergy in uh, co-coaching and working with others in supervision. But what what would you say about supervision in particular, Angelos, um, from your perspective that's important? Uh, From my perspective and from my experience, uh, not not only as a supervisee, but also as a supervisor, uh, I have found that people coming are getting so much clarity about how they function and first of all what exactly has happened in in the team coaching session (laughs) (laughs) and who am i in this play in this theatrical play who am i what's mine to do but uh, you are right you're both right Uh, having a co-coach dyad a system within the system or uh, side by side with a bigger system that's uh, very important in, in, in from many aspects. For example, uh, as you said earlier, Dorothy, you have to, it's been mandated, for example, based on the competencies that the coach must uh, be transparent. The coach must 
uh, model vulnerability. So if it's hard to do that when you're on your own, how hard can that be when you're with a co-coach? Well, Alison, yeah, you you have sort of trailblazed something of the conversation about how team coaches are held in their reflection around this complexity for years now. Yes, I think I was struck that in the early stages of exploring this this realm of team coaching, I was struck by the linear nature of some of the models of team coaching that were rational, logical, we have a preparation, we have a start, we have a middle and we have an end. And that's terrific and may give a framework and a foundation. But when we're in the room with a client, what I'm very conscious of from the supervisor's point of view, the coach may not know where they are. They may hope that they're following a linear progression. And my I have developed what I call a map, which shows that any one element, like culture, like the psychological phenomena, like the leadership, like the interrelationships, one of those elements could be in the foreground and if there is a change in the leadership, what does that do to the culture or to the other relationships or to the evaluation of the work? And my my map is informed by the work of Nora Bateson and Warm Data, and it's living interconnectedness. So I great to have a direction of travel, but if we look at the natural world, things happen there's a thunderstorm here there's a heat wave there there's a tsunami over here and if we allow the natural environment to see what surfaces we can perhaps hold in a container there nothing is constant Mm -hmm. and that i hope communicates that Wherever our attention goes, we can follow that and other elements will be affected and affect whatever is happening in the room, in the process, over a period that as a coach, it's really hard to stay in touch with the ground when all of this maelstrom of of interconnectedness is going on and my my map I hope communicates the breathing the breathingness the livingness of what happens in this work and we cannot hold transfixed to one pathway because we don't know what's going to happen when because we're in a human relational practice and humans aren't always predictable. Yeah, that's great. And I, I think you use a metaphor of think of it, think of the map as like a forest, a living forest where there's so many things growing and happening and chewing and crunching and walking. And, you know, it's 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 alive. And in yes. that context, Angelos, then what what is it as an experienced team coach and a trainer of team coaches? What is it then if that's the context? that becomes most important for a team coach to hang on to. Could I add something there that I'm really struck, Dorothy, by this, the expectation of the client group team and what they project onto the coach to fix them. Mm -hmm. And this work is very, has very strong orientation around relationship and interrelationship And what I hear with coaches in supervision is that teams come together and they don't actually know each other relationally and the urgency and the pressure to deliver results and get on with the task constantly interferes with 
well, who is this person I'm with and that I need to cooperate with and interact with and ask for help from and provide support to? I don't know them and they don't know me. So this whole notion of relational getting to know and trust each other as human beings often has never existed and how does this play be provide the underpinning for successful team coaching when the pressure is on to deliver a result whatever that result may be or look like yeah. mm. mm -hmm. and if i may ask sometimes the question might be you know, what kind of uh, maybe a subconscious question. What kind of contracts do I need to make with the rest of the team members in my team so that I can get the kind of behavior that I would anticipate when I'm doing X or Y? And uh, how do, in, on which basis are we building trust, for example? And, uh, and to go back to the start question, I think it's, uh, team coaching is... Um, is that it makes it so easy for a team coach to sleep in different roles, like telling the other what to do, sleep into the manager role or the the trainer role, and so on. So it's um, to put it in a different words, I would say that the uh, uh, the team coach's role is to orchestrate the dialogue that the team needs to have between them, so they can develop a common. Uh, language or culture, yeah. understanding how they will work together, not just getting to know each other, but the getting to um, build trust in the in, in the sense that Fernando Flores has, uh, is writing about trust in his book Building Trust. Uh, it's about another agreement, another contract. How do we? go from here where we need to go together as a team. Yeah. Yeah. So much to so much to think about what, what's really coming through for me and it's very important in my practice, but I is 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 as Allison said, people are really focused on task. It's almost like that's the most important thing. And really, I think we are at task and results and KPIs. And you're sometimes asked as a team coach, and Angela, so I haven't found this in your book yet. It may or may not be there. The whole the whole pressure on a team coach to tell them what is the return on investment that oh. they're making here by doing an intervention in relationship, usually. Um, is there something here about that, um, Angela? Uh, ways to evaluate, yes, there are. Uh, I think it's an ongoing conversation, but it's very important to have the evaluation. It's part of the, uh, there's a, um, a, a chapter, I don't remember the, the number right now. There is a, a map with a, uh, with a spiral uh, yeah. that, that shows how you start from the intervention and have the, what's the step for the evaluation and reevaluate and so on. So for sure, this is something that needs to be taken care of. Um, not it just for be, it might yeah. be chapter eight, Angelos. Oh, well, thank you very much. Coaching, and there's the evaluation and assessment in measuring success section. Thank you. Yeah, I've chosen oh, That's right. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that is right. <laughs> Uh, but, but, but yeah, so so it's it is important to um, what I've noticed about myself in the past, and what some people coming to me, I, I want to tell them, yes, I can do it, <laughs> you know, and and yet the return on investment is often not their results in their KPIs, but a different way of being in relationship that facilitates the team to have greater success, and that's harder to measure. Than some of the kind of more core ways that we do measure um, effectiveness. I don't know what either of you might might say about that. So that's even just going into an assignment, not just measuring our own success of what we've done, but going in. How do we 
How do we talk about what it is we can do? Well, I would love to pick that one up, Angelos, if just and show that in in that that is one of the things that team coaches seem to find difficulty in. What is it that they are offering that may or may not be clear to describe because it may not be tangible or visible or measurable and that generates uncertainty in the team coach but they don't know how to inspire their client to buy that because they're not actually neither party is necessarily clear on what is being bought so that was how I would wanted to re- respond to your question, Dorothy. Angelos, I fear I inter- intervened. <laughs> yeah, the, the, these are some uh, very interesting uh, points you both mentioned, Alison and Dorothy. And it, it's intriguing to think about what are the things that should be bought, as you said, or uh, when you talk about KPIs earlier, Dorothy, uh, maybe um, the answer is another question. So in order to uh, create these KPIs, uh, in order to achieve the, the metrics that you want from your KPIs, what do we need to create so that your people can create that kind of performance that will be measured with the KPIs? And I think that maybe, if you allow me, goes back to that uh, coaching is not about the the processes, is about the people. Usually, when you talk about the, when you look at the processes, you're most might be looking for a consultant rather than a coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I actually actually say that myself going into interventions. I really try to be clear. I am not a consultant with solutions. I'm coming in to hold a mirror up and use tools and techniques to help you communicate differently. It's about the how, not the what. You know, all kinds of language. And but there probably are team coaches who who or maybe a mixture again to go back to is this team building? Is this team coaching? Is I think you you talk about this in the book, Angela. Sometimes we need to go in as a mixture of um, I'll bring some consultancy and I'll bring some coaching. But mm-hmm. our clarity about which hat we're wearing and when <laughs> is very important for us and for them. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm just there's so much here. There are um, there are ethical things we need to think about, too, such as who mm-hmm. are we contracting with the sponsor? as well as the team and what if the what if the sponsor is the team lead speaking of roles and hats and then what needs to change if they're also in the team coaching that was a complexity it took me some years of getting not quite right to start to learn to about um there are exercises people can do in purple and in, in just about every section purple by the way i see you're both wearing purple in honor of our book here um, I, I didn't get the memo about the fact that i should be wearing purple for today but in, purple, in, in the book there are whole areas for reflection uh exercises that people can do with teams that they can do on their own i mean it really is a tour de force of a collection there are. I, I also saw your your section on on various different team coaching models, from Peter Hawkins's uh, Sid Clear model to Dave, David Clutterbuck's Peril model to, the, of course, the famous Patrick Lencioni model, um, uh, and and your own model, the Magic model, Angelos, that you teach as well. Um, so there's there's some there's something for everyone. There's various different ways to approach this. Um, and, and, and I guess I'm wondering, there's his, the history of team coaching and how it came about and how it got recognized. Mm. So I suppose I'm wondering, is there something we want to pull out before we end this interview that, that feels like it, it doesn't want to go missing, that we want to talk about, that we haven't mentioned yet? As you asked that, as you asked that question, Dorothy, um, 
there's something and you've highlighted so many different aspects of what this book has to offer this is a not start at chapter one and read through chapter two chapter three chapter four chapter five in a sequence it is sequential but at the same time because of its breadth if there's an aspect of practice of team coaching that any of us are interested in we could look at the chapter headings look at the content go to the index and say ah i want to know more about deference i want to know more about models i want to know more about evaluation and actually it, it is very accessible and clearly presented to be able to say, ah, today I'm interested in evaluation, I'm going to chapter eight. Today I'm interested in the different models, I'm going to chapter three. It, it, so I think there's something here that I find appealing, that it's not a read from page one to page 350. It's a it's it has a, a such a range that it's a dip in dip out and come back to and keep referring to from so many different angles and that's the thing that i would would like to add to what is already we've highlighted dorothy extremely thorough and comprehensive and very clearly uh thought about and shared and and offered here in this book I couldn't agree more. And um, <laughs> I, I, if there were two things that I would uh, emphasize, I'd like to make it very simple. I would say that uh, this book helps uh, team coach to first uh, learn what they need to learn about team coaching, so they can get uh, they have a solid foundation. And uh, but not only that, uh, get some practical directions on what they need to do in different cases, and look to find what there might be missing that they really need to be aware of to make sure that they practice put it in practice correctly, and that uh, they they. Uh, um, they're doing whatever is their, theirs to do in terms of taking care of their own team coaching, their own supervision, and also being on the ethical side of things, not for the sake of just being ethical, but because um, it works. And you, it works for the clients. It works for everyone involved in all these very complex contracts with all the stakeholders. So, um you have to learn from others' best practices as well as from others' mistakes, right? Yeah, and your own mistakes, because there, there we will all be making mistakes in the work, or so-called mistakes. Some of them might be bigger than others, but the, the, this is the process of learning, isn't it? Is learning from the those who've come before you, and the the from your own experience. Um, I suppose, you know, a little bit like your book is constructed with a chapter towards the end about the future of team coaching. I suppose it, it could be useful for us to, to end this with a thinking about what is it that we're imagining or hoping for or, you know, we know it's the fastest, apparently the fastest growing area of the coaching industry at the moment, team coaching, and probably supervision coming along in its wake because it's so important. So what are we all hoping for or imagining as we look to the future of this of this particular type of coaching? Well, it may sound idealistic, but I would uh, hope for a future where people where people can live authentically uh, in their lives, you know, in their work within the teams so that they can be able to bring their authentic self and invite the others to do so as well. So uh, the team will flourish, the organization will flourish, and that will create some extra value for their own personal life as well. That's wonderful, uh, Angelos, and you are saying that. I realize something quite core about what this work is about, authenticity for for the people in teams and for coaches doing the work and some some way of really showing up as one's full self therefore realizing the potential of the self in the team, in the system, 
it feels all about potential. Thank you for sharing that. And and you, Alison, what would you what would you say? I think it sort of extends from what you've said. There's something listening to what you've said about the impact societally that we in organizations that can make a much more positive contribution if we are inviting and enabling people who are working in organizations in teams to make a i want to say a more human contribution then we are not just cogs in a wheel we're not just machines we are not just computers that our authenticity and humanity will bring a societal influence at a local and at a global level, which the world needs right now. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for that. And what that gets me in touch with is the speed of technological change coming alongside that wish we're all holding that people can really be authentic to themselves and in relationship to each other and not become robots at the same time as learning to work with robots you know um not be replaced by so much as come alongside with um i suppose my dream is that it continues to be a fast growing part of the profession because it's so needed right now and that that people remember the focus is about relationships relationships with self relationships with other relationships with the planet um warm data the interdependence and interrelatedness of everything and less separateness i think it's actually quite wonderful to think of it being a fast growing area of the profession and to see so clearly how it how it interacts with the one-to-one -one coaching as well. Um, they have a lot to offer each other. So um, thank you both very much for coming to participate <laughs> in a roundtable conversation. I, the enthusiasm we all hold uh, is here. I hope anyone listening to this will hear uh, that there's a real passion here for this subject. Um, and thank you, Angelos, for bringing, bringing something new into the world that also helps a lot of people discover what are the common uh, standards and methodologies and ways that most people talk about this profession. It's a really valuable contribution. Thank you. And one of them is about reflection. So, uh, 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 sorry to interrupt, Dorothy. I just no. want to notify everyone that I'm uh, will be recording this session. So, uh, from this moment on. So, if you want to open up your camera or not, be aware of that. And uh, uh, we want to be to to let everyone who has registered but had not had the opportunity to sign in at the. Um, specified moment uh, so that they can see the recording afterwards and maybe for those who will participate as well so um the microphone is back to you dorothy <laughs> thanks angelos and let me just we are contracting here for a second everybody so we <laughs> will be recording and uh, we'd love to see your pictures if you'd like to come on and be in conversation with us also let's be clear how long will we be here to answer a few questions angelos um, how much time will we be here for this uh, i think um 10 15 minutes would that be okay for everyone Okay, so we'll stay until, let's say, just at the latest until quarter past the hour, um, where most of us might be living. Um, and um, and and welcome, hello, um, Eva and Athena and Anna and anyone else turning on your camera. 
Um, so we'll stay here, we'll answer some questions, um, and we are on the subject of contracting, and it feels like we should maybe start there, perhaps. So, um, Ava, uh, would you like to also, you've, you've written your, your, your question here in chat, but would you like to also just ask it here so we can be in relationship with you? Hi, yes, of course. Um, yeah, well, what I was thinking about was, okay, when we, you were discussing about like, where the team, uh, like this, there's so many parts of the team, okay? And there's so many uh, systems that exist within the team, et cetera. Um, so I was, what I was, what came to mind was like, okay, um, sometimes they don't even know what they're there, what, you know, what they want. Let's, 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 uh, I think Allison mentioned something like that. Um, and I was just thinking, Okay, uh, maybe one question would be, um, okay, let, like, where do you want to be, like, at the end of this? So that would be part of contracting, wouldn't it? Or would that be too leading? Angela, I think you replied something to that. You have to be careful uh, with the sponsor, I think you mentioned, and, and who do you discuss this with? Okay. Oh, I so. think that's another question, actually, Ava. I think that's yeah, another question. Yeah, it is too. <laughs> yes. So, so really, you're asking, um, um, what what are the kinds of questions we ask a team about how it um, how the it wants to? Yeah, the importance of the of contracting with a team, and and it and it, I find that that can also be a very complex uh, process. Yeah. Yeah. Can I, yeah, can I and start? I just some help on that, maybe, <laughs> with people here with more experience. Yeah, go ahead, Angelos. Thank you very much, Eva. And uh, I think this is um, it's a complicated issue, and it's it's so important uh, to try to make it very simple uh, to be able to contain even a few sentences here for the purpose of our discussion today, I would say that A, it's very important to make sure, for, you know, when we're talking about team coaching, there will be a sponsor, an HR sponsor or the team leader, uh, somebody on the board, uh, there will be a sponsor somewhere and you are being hired to achieve a certain goals. So you are making uh, a contract with the company, with some person from the company. So when you guys are working with the team, whatever that team might be, uh, the first need is to make uh, alignment, which is in a sense similar, well, not the same because it's much more uh, complex, but it's similar when you're uh, in the way that in individual coaching, you're having an executive coaching session. There's a, it's a, a it's a tripartite, so there, there must be an alignment. But, uh, and then it's important to understand not just the, uh, how do you to the alignment and it's also important to make sure that everybody understands and is committed to achieve uh, the same goals. But I think this is twofold. Uh, the second thing that you should be uh, able, intentional and very aware that you should be making that is when you are in the room or in the virtual room uh, that you are creating some kind of contract on how people will uh, how people want to work with each other through this process, through this whole trajectory. And of course, throughout the trajectory, you have to maintain the agreement or if there's a need to revise the agreement, extend the agreement, uh, you have to bring that into the surface, bring, bring that into the conversation and make sure uh, that everybody is, uh, that the agreement is working and that the team is working uh, in accordance with the agreement they have made with each other and everyone that is involved. Hope that uh, includes that yeah. somehow. Alison, would you like to add something here? Thank you. Um, the thing that I find in supervision is that often the issues that arise when a coach comes and says, can we talk about this client project? The issue is this, the this contracting has, has not been quite thorough enough. 
So um, I guess what I would build on Angelos's guidelines is take your time with your contracting, make sure that you encourage people to participate in the contracting and be ready to adapt the agreement for the outcome because it the first agreement is highly likely to change and evolve and be different as mm. the work carries on. Once we think we've got the contract sorted, we've just got started and it's likely we have to keep contracting to review, to refine, to mm. adapt because it's never a straight line of, right, we've agreed yeah. we're going here. Actually, no, we're not. <laughs> yeah, it's it's... <laughs> It can happen in in executive coaching too. Yes, it will exactly frequently. Exactly. And <laughs> and I'm sure that's a lovely example, Ava, because in in executive coaching, the client says they want to improve their performance in this area. Or you get three sessions in, and the agreement is completely different. That's right. Then, so yeah. Im imagine that escalated with ten people in a team. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Take take your time, and and, and 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 there's something here about uh, forewarn the client, the sponsor, that this is likely to change. Is quite important, I would suggest. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's very helpful. Nice Great question, Angela. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe from awesome. here we could build in Athena's question, which is related, which is when we're contracting with the team leader or the sponsor, is there anything else we need to be attending to? Athena, do you want to add to that, What, what to your question, the substance? She's frozen. She might be frozen. There she is. Um, no. There she is. Right. Here she is. Well, yes and no, I think. <laughs> I think there are some connection issues with Athena. While mm -hmm. that's sorting while that's sorting out, because she's going off and on trying to fix that. What would you start with, Angelos, around specifically with the team leader or sponsor? What are some points to be careful about? With regards to what? With regards to contracting, so building on what we're saying. Yes, I think it's important to include uh, include some way of measuring uh, and uh, of measuring uh, what is the uh, <clears throat> the team status at the beginning. Uh, include in your design. Uh, I would prefer to include some kind of a, a, a diagnostic, some kind of uh, um, of an of an assessment tool that can give us a snapshot of where they are at the beginning of the session, of the of the trajectory. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, we feel very uh, confident in our work. I would feel that uh, we would all be talking the, and measuring the same language. I, I would say that we would get hard data. Uh, from this tool, from this diagnostic, uh, and an alignment on what we're trying to achieve. And then at the end of the trajectory, we can run the same diagnostic again. So we can have a proper evaluation, which is based on uh, harm data, hard data on uh, what has happened, what has improved. And um, so we can have uh, evaluation. I think that will be um, serving uh, our work. The, and the work that the sponsor is doing as well. Great. So they can feel safe about the effectiveness of the team coaching. Yeah, great. Thank you. So there's some clarity and education and um, promise of some sort of evaluation for the sponsor or the team leader. Um, how about, uh, and poor Athena, she's trying to come on and off and I see keeps getting frozen. So I hope we're covering her question. Alison, anything that you would like to, to add to this about specifically in contracting with the team leader or the sponsor? Uh, yes, I think I would add, how does the sponsor or team leader contract and engage their team in 
engaging in this project. Mm. Because sometimes the team leader may say, oh, I want us to do team coaching, but may not have consulted or discussed it or identified what may be needed with the team members. And potentially as coach, we could go in there and we've got a team of people who say, well, what am I doing here? I didn't ask for this. <laughs> That's a great, that's a great point. Um, so it's how does the sponsor actually engage their team in this? It's not for us yet, if you like, ahead of the game to pave the way mm -hmm. before we go in for our diagnostics or whatever it is that we're going to do. Mm. That has me think of a, if it's all right for me to just share something too, is that uh, we want to be careful as coaches that that the sponsor is not outsourcing their own work to do to the team coach. There can be a feeling of fix them over there. Um, it could be a senior <laughs> leader team who brings in the coach to fix the lex to fix the next layer down, sort them out. And so there's something about being sure that we're not a proxy for something else. Um, but also there's some there's a subtlety I learned about uh, working with the team leader is that if the team leader is also the sponsor and the team leader is also in the team, I need to have two different contracts, one with the team leader as sponsor um, and one with the team leader as a member of the team. And there's a different expectation. I, I, Angelos and Allison, I'm sure you may have seen this yeah. too. There's how to hold those boundaries so that the team can trust that I'm not going to the team leader and telling them everything about the team separately. Um, being really transparent about who the contract is with. Is there anything either of you want to say about about no, that? I would just support that. Mm. Yeah. It, this is, uh, Dorothy, you're touching on something which is very important. I would say that uh, it's it's complex. It's uh, again going back to contracting. Uh, you have to be very thorough in the contracting that you're doing with every part, which is every part that it's involved. Uh, if if I if I want to keep something in mind is and I want to inspire that to and somehow align with uh, the team leader for in your example is that the change will come from the room from whoever is in the room. So if I'm working with a team client, that means the team uh, client will grow through the coaching process and they will be able to create the outcomes, uh, commit and deliver uh, that they have agreed upon in the beginning of their trajectory. Uh, so the leader should, unless we contract differently otherwise, the, the leader should allow that to happen and not intervene in the sense of, uh, like, for example, micromanager. Oh, that answers. I think it's very helpful. Thank you. And because Atina is now having to um, communicate with us by chat, I want to honor her question and then come to Paris after that. Um, and uh, Athena is asking, do you propose to describe in the contract the kind of interventions that need to be done? What would you say to that, Angelos, um, in particular, because you're when you're doing team coaching, do we tell what it is we're going to be doing with the team? Do we do we explain yes, that? Yes. Yeah, I think to a certain extent you have to have a clear idea. You have to uh, you, you have the responsibility of what you are offering, of what you are suggesting, how you are designing the team coach trajectory or the whole intervention. And that me and. Uh, um, and you also should take into account that different kind of elements that you might put inside the intervention would differ, make differentiations in the cost as well. So it's not, you know, it's not um, good to have. It's something which is very, very important, makes it clear contracting. Could I add to that? I'm looking at Athena's question. Do you propose to describe in the contract the kind of interventions that need to be done? And I, once again, I there's something for me about 
keeping our options open for things changing as the project goes on. So it might be that we say, well, there are some key interventions and they are likely to modify or change or we might need to do something different if the circumstances, the market, the team, the organisation, the economy, if something in the wider context changes, we, we need to be able to adapt and modify what it is that we're going to do. And we need to build that in up front to manage the expectation of the client that we're not just going from A to B to C to D, because that's what it looked like at the beginning. Right. Absolutely. Wonderful. So, yes, we need to talk a little bit about the interventions and we need to be flexible and help the client understand we need to be flexible for whatever emerges in, in the coaching. We, I think we might have time for one more question here. Again, I thought it was from Paris, but it looks like it's from Athena also. And that is um, moving on to supervision, the reflection part of team coaching. Is there a certain way to approach it? Um, because there's a sense Athena has that it's different from one-to-one -one coaching. So what would uh, we're all supervisors. What would you two say? What is it that's, you know, is there a certain way to approach it? Yes, Alison. Would you like to take I'm, this I'm, I'm holding the question. It's a lovely question. How, yes. how do I differentiate? I think that one of the biggest challenges in as a supervisor is to sit with the complexity and and the what I will call the messiness that the coach brings to supervision, and not try to fix the team. So how do we invite the coach to join me in their confusion or their lack of certainty or their not knowing what to do or their delight or pleasure? And how, how do we dance around what may or may not be happening? Because it's very difficult to have a definitive diagnosis of what is really going on and or advocate what the coach could or should do. So we as supervisors need to help the, the coach reflect <coughs> flexibly, I think would be the way I would describe it. We need flexibility and we need to support the coach to hold this phenomenon, this experience lightly and be able to dance with what is happening and stay in curiosity and non-judgment. Yeah. Yes, yeah. even if I w w can put a picture into what you said, immediately where my mind went is to... <laughs> it's well, Alison's it map. Well, but it's the map that you have created and it's included in uh, in the book, in your chapter, the map, mapping the territory of team coaching. Uh, so I think this gives um, a first idea of uh, the, how what makes uh, reflection different in in, yes. in in comparison to individual coaching or um, in individual supervision. Yes, yeah. Um, one more thing to add. Uh, Ava, Ava's uh, about to speak. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Ava. I'm sorry. I saw you going. <laughs> I was. I was. I was looking for the hand. <laughs> Put up my hand. <laughs> um, what's What's been kind of uh, in my mind lately is uh, our new reality, which is the virtual world. <laughs> Uh, and uh, remote teams um, and and all the challenges that I just it's too many I we don't have time I think today to to go into it I just wanted to bring it up as as really something that I think we is there's a lot of room to do more research in there's a lot of room to do um, you know more um, observation um, etc and um, because it, it, it's, I think that's that's going to grow, and it's growing, and 
and I think that there are different dynamics there uh, that uh, might play a role, and it's yes. quite challenging. I, it, you know, I, I'm not gonna. I was gonna ask how does how would you deal with a remote team where not everyone wants to be there? <laughs> uh, I would say come but to supervision, it's a long, it's a <laughs> Excuse me, Alison. I would say come to supervision. Right. <laughs> good, good point. Uh, make a note of that. Absolutely. Right. I think supervision I, question. Talking a contract, I think this is a book launch rather than a supervision <laughs> session. But I hope you hear that in the spirit which we've done. Well, you work. know, I, I, I'm, still, I'm still at it. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry. And talking of contracting, we said we would stay until quarter till, and we're almost there now. And so there's something too about how to keep the time when we say that we will have the time, even though <laughs> what I notice is a hunger to open up lots of questions. And, yes. and I think all three of us are really open to have a discussion further. Or, but there's so much in this book, and Angela, so it feels like it would be really important to give. Well, first to honor you for bringing this into the yes. market for all of us, because it really is an important thing that you've done here. And um, to give you the last word here, really, anything you want to say to people who've been with us this evening to close? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Dorothy, for uh, moderating this discussion. And uh, a big thank you to Alison as well for contributing her chapter in this book and for being such an inspiration in my uh, journey in team coaching uh, I think it's wonderful I think it's um we all I, I would assume that we uh, what brings us here and uh, have us been uh, stuck no nobody left uh, I think that's uh, it's it's not unusual nobody left from this uh, team session so I think that shows how much uh, love we we bring into team coaching so a big, big thank you to everyone. And of course, we are open for um, uh, other discussions in the future if uh, if it's required. Alison, would you like to uh, say oh, something? Thank you. Well, it's been a pleasure, eh? a privilege to contribute to your book, Angelos. Dorothy, thank you for moderating. And thank you to those of you who are here and so eager to engage in participate and have conversation with us which is really lovely as as we know team coaching particularly is relational practice and you can perhaps tell that we're pretty into relational practice and it's lovely that you two those of you who have joined us are likewise involved so thank you very much for being here and sharing this with us thank you everybody thank you. enjoy the rest thank of the you. week thank you thank, thank you very you. much thank you thank, thank you everybody Bye-bye.